Then at Hollisley Bay Prison, just before Christmas, everything changed. We're all in the canteen waiting for lunch when the chefs came in and started serving up a load of absolute crap. Now normally, I'd eat anything, anything at all, without complaint. But this stuff was just shit. It turned out they'd planned something else, but it had all gone pear-shaped, so they knocked up something else together at the last minute. It was this well dodgy looking stew with loads of half-cooked potatoes, bits of vegetable and lumps of fat floating around in it. It looked and smelled disgusting. I wouldn't have given it to a dog. We refused to eat it and demanded something else. At first, everybody was really into the protest. We were all shouting and banging on the tables with our cutlery, standing on the chairs and making a right racket. But then, as it got to the end of the lunch break, the screws started threatening people that if they didn't go back to work, they'd be in big trouble. At Hollisley Bay, every prisoner gets given some job. You do the job and you get paid. Not very much, but enough to buy the old phone card or a few stamps. If you don't work, if you refuse, you get thrown out of the nice, soft, open prison and you get sent to a hellhole called HMP Nice Point, which is so awful, everybody takes the piss out of it, calls it Nice Point. Once the screws started mentioning that, the protest started to fall apart. But a few of us, me and about three others, refused to budge. If the food had been okay, I wouldn't have made such a fuss, but the way they treated us was right out of order. I was just standing up for what I believed in. One of the other protesters was a bloke from my landing who had spent most of the time giving me the cold shoulder. He was a big bloke, not a bodybuilder type, but certainly not someone you'd want to mess with because he always looked a bit fierce. From the things he said and the way he acted around the prison, you just knew he was really bright, really ultra clever. When the protest had started, everybody straight away voted him the spokesperson and all the way through he'd been the one shouted loudest about how out of order the whole thing was. He'd been around a while. And you could tell he just didn't give a fuck. The last thing he was going to do was let the screws intimidate him. Eventually, the governor himself came down, apologised and promised to look into it. As none of us had eaten, he sent down some fresh rolls with loads of ham and cheese. As we were stuffing our faces and celebrating our victory, the bloke leaned over and held out his hand. Michael Steele, but you can call me Mick, he said. From there on, my social life started to improve drastically. Mick, who was in for drug smuggling introduced me to the guy who had the room opposite him, Jack Worms. He was another big bloke, six foot wide as well as tall, and looked like he probably lived in a cave. He was a sweet bloke though, and an absolute brilliant engineer. There was nothing he didn't know about all sorts of mechanical things. One of the easiest ways to wind Jack up was to call some part of a car engine by the wrong name, pretend you didn't know what it was. It would start fuming, and then correct you. It was really funny. He couldn't read that well, and he didn't have much to say. But when it comes to certain subjects, he was in a class of his own. His brother John was also banged up with us at the same time, having been caught with Jack on a car ringing scam. Neither of the Wones brothers could exactly be described as the sharpest tools in the box, but it was clear that Jack really idolised Mick, thought he was the most fantastic bloke in the whole world, or do anything for him. It was easy to see why. Mick was really clever, much cleverer than anyone else I knew, and he was also really interested in funny. Being a bit older than the rest of us, Meant we all looked up to him like a father figure. We started spending more and more time together, and along with John Donnelly, we formed a bit of a gang. Then a bloke called Francis Reed got sent to Hollisley. It turned out that a year or so earlier, I'd sold some dodgy tenors to a bloke in Braintree, who'd sold about a grand's worth to Francis. He'd driven down to Great Yarmouth and run the notes through loads of the change machines you get at the amusement arcades, and was heading back to Essex with 900 odd pound coins in the boot of his car. He got pulled over for speeding, and while the police were having a quick look over the car, they found the coins. They'd guessed he'd been up to something, but didn't know what, so they let him go. About three months later, Francis was just starting to think he might have got away with the whole thing when they came round and nicked him for distributing counterfeit currency. It turned out they'd found one of his fingerprints and one of the notes inside one of the change machines. He thought it was hilarious that me and Donnelly were at the prison, and he ended up joining our little gang. Because Hollinsley had such an easy regime, Everybody who had mates who were everywhere else in the prison system wanted to get them along there. After we'd become friendly, Mick started telling me about a friend of his that he'd met when he was banged up in Swaleside and how he'd written to him, saying that he should get his ass over to Hollinsley Bay because it was such a doddle. I don't know how the guy had managed to swing it, but about two weeks later, Mick said that he was on his way. This bloke turned up and he was absolutely fucking enormous. When he stood in a doorway, he fooled the entire thing. He didn't have arms. It was like someone had stuck an extra pair of legs into his shoulders. He was just massive. Mick was really excited. 
and took him around, introducing him to everyone. Here, Darren, this is the bloke I was telling you about. This is Pat. Pat Tate. He might have been a giant, but Pat was a really nice bloke. Really friendly, and with a brilliant sense of humour. The two of us just really hit it off. And used to train down the gym together all the time. He really became one of the best friends I had in the Nick. People used to say he was a violent man, but I never saw any violence in him. He was only a 12 year old when he first got into trouble. He'd found a wallet on the roof of a packed car with more than £300 in it. It turned out to be the fund for a police Christmas party. He blew the lot on leather jackets and a record player for him and his mates. They took cab rides to fancy restaurants in Cambridge and tipped the drivers, which must have been the equivalent of a week's wages. When the police finally tracked him down, the other boys had been bragging about what they'd been getting up to. He got sent to an approved school. When Pat was straight and in them early days, that was most of the time, he took about how awful it was. He really felt bad that his dad beating him and his mother and his brother and the fact that his parents had split up when he was just five had this huge effect on him. I spent a lot of time in his cell. He didn't invite many people in and he really opened up to me. He always thought that it was hilarious that he had this really nasty reputation and everyone expected him to be a real monster. But the truth was the only thing he ever got really angry about was his bad back. He was a good friend. He'd always help me out whenever he could. He helped out a lot of people. He was brilliant down the gym as well. Because he was really strong and could pick up anything, he felt confident that he could take on more weight than you would when you was on your own. If you got stuck, he'd just come over and get you out of trouble. Because he was so big, most people were terrified of him. And he took advantage of that to get his own way. None of the screws would dare strip search him after visits and when he made it clear that he wanted a job as the assistant in the gym, they just kicked the bloke out who was doing it rather than piss him off. Mick and Pat were also really close. Pat was on a different wing, but most nights he would come over to Mick's room and the two of them would spend the night laughing and joking. With Pat there, our little gang was complete. We were big enough and tough enough to do pretty much whatever we wanted. So we did. Our wives would come along on visiting days and before long, they all got to know each other. Sandra was quite shy and didn't like to mix. But Mick's partner Jackie Street and Pat's girlfriend Sarah Saunders had known each other for a while and got on like a house on fire. They would often travel up together. Because of that, she got really friendly with Mick as well. And that made Mick and Pat closer. It was like one big happy family. It seems stupid that anyone should think of the time that they spent in prison as being some of the happiest times of their life. But once we're all together... That is exactly what they were to me. When the weather was nice, we'd all go for long walks. Or Pat and me would go down to the gym and work out where the Wimeses, Steele and the others would play badminton. We'd all watch TV together, eat our meals in each other's rooms, everything. We basically just made it easier for one another and made the time go faster. And we got away with pretty much anything. The main things that most people miss when they're inside are drink, decent food and women. And we had a lot. I managed to get myself a top job in the kitchen, so at the end of each day, or sometimes at the beginning, I used to keep stuff to one side and take it back to the cells later. We'd always have the best cuts from the butcher, the freshest rolls, the creamiest milk, the lot. As for sex, we made sure we didn't go without. There was an old officer's mess building at the back of the prison, about three fields away from the main complex. When we first got there and had the freedom to walk anywhere, We'd take it in turns to go there with our wives or girlfriends during lunch and have a quick bunk up while the others kept a lookout for the guards. Mick used to go there twice a week for a picnic and a shag with his partner Jackie and come back pissed out of his head on champagne. We also developed a system for getting other food and drinks into the place. There was no point in storing it anywhere for more than a day because we knew the screws would find it. Instead we started getting stuff delivered. We also started a rotor for visitors so that we'd get a constant supply of spirits and other things we couldn't get out of the kitchen. Sometimes we kept them hidden in shampoo bottles, but most of the time they were drunk so quick, all we needed to do was chuck out the empties. One time we ordered a £60 Chinese takeaway and a crate of lager. We got the restaurant to put the whole lot in a taxi, and John Worm snuck out the prison perimeter and picked it up. Then we sat in the cell and had a blinding party. There was so much booze around we spent most of the time completely off our faces, one of the favourite nighttime party games was shotgun and cans of lager in the cells. You take a small can of beer, you really don't want to do it with a large can, and you lay it on its side. You then take a key and make a small hole at the end furthest away from the ring pool. Then you put your mouth over the hole and suck as hard as you can. But because there's nowhere for any air to escape, 
none of the beer comes out. The moisture's still sucking, you pull the ring, and in about three seconds, the whole can of beer goes down your throat. It's a real hit. You basically go, whoa, and then do another one, and then you generally fall over. Unless you get your timing wrong, or you don't swallow properly, in which case you just end up covered in beer. The screws always knew what we was up to, but we were just left alone, particularly because of Pat. No one wanted to get on the wrong side of him. The other thing we used to do to pass the time was talk about all the stuff we'd got up to in the past. I talk about getting knocked out in a telephone box and sitting in a hotel lobby, not knowing that I was completely surrounded by armed police. Francis would talk about being pulled up for speeding with hundreds of pound coins in his boot, and then the others would take a turn. Jack had a brilliant story. He used to go around nicking bits of farm machinery, tractors and diggers and those sorts of things. One day he was driving about and spotted this really tasty looking tractor in the middle of a field. So he made a plan to go back and nick it later that day. He got rid of the engine and chassis numbers, anything that could be used to identify it, and sold it to some contact of his, who then sold it to a farmer in Wales. Now this tractor was really state of the art. It had all these gadgets and flashy bits on it that you don't normally get, so the farmer who brought it was always showing it off to his mates. His neighbour, another farmer, was so impressed he decided he wanted to buy one himself. He found up the company that makes them and asked him if he could have one of the new X400 tractors. They didn't know what he was talking about. He said, the X400, you know it does this, it does that. It has this function, it has that function. The bloke on the farm next to me has one. They still didn't have a clue what he was on about, but they took his details and promised to call him back. Next thing he knew, the farm next door was full of police and both farmers had been arrested. It turned out that the tractor Jack had nicked was a prototype, the only one of its kind in the world. The police managed to follow the trail back and arrest most of those involved, but by a stroke of luck, Jack managed to get away with it. Mick also had some fantastic stories, especially the scams he used to get up to when he was younger in the 60s. The first thing he made real money from was red diesel, the stuff that farm machinery and factories that use diesel are run on. You don't pay any tax on red diesel. Nowadays, it costs around 50 pence a gallon, while the white stuff costs around five times as much. But they're exactly the same. They just add a bit of dye to the white stuff to turn it red. When he was 18, Mick, being the clever boy that he is, worked out a way of getting rid of the dye. He went out and bought himself a tanker and filled it with 10,000 gallons of red diesel. He then mixed in a load of filler's earth and let the whole thing settle for a few days. The fuller's earth took out the dye and Mick skimmed all the white diesel off the top and sold it to a couple of cab firms for a tidy profit. It was a slow process and difficult to judge how much fuller's earth you needed. So when Mick found this garage in the middle of nowhere, where this bloke who ran it added the dye himself, he came up with a different approach. Mick went in with his tanker and asked for 10,000 gallons of red. The bloke filled it up and then went out to add the dye. Mick offered to give the guy a fistful of cash if the dye somehow didn't make it into the tanker. So the bloke just split a bit around the hinge to make it look like he'd done it and then Mick drove off. He sold the whole lot immediately for three times the price then went straight back to the garage. And that was the beginning of a brilliant criminal relationship. Now the trouble is the red diesel only has a few specialist uses. It's not really the sort of thing that you can sell tens of thousands of gallons of in the height of the summer. Yet this tiny garage in the middle of nowhere had sold more than half a million gallons of the stuff in less than three months. The firm that owned the garage launched a major investigation and the bloke got sacked, while well, Mick got 18 months. Then there was Pat Tate. His whole 10 year sentence was purely down to the fact that he'd been off his face in a happy to restaurant in Basildon one day. He'd basically gone there after a weekend of non-stop clubbing with his girlfriend Sarah Saunders and got into an argument over the bill. He'd hit the cashier and it's 800 pound out the till. He and Sarah had both got arrested and Pat was found to have loads of cocaine, speed and puff on him. A couple of weeks later, he was in the Ballariki Magistrates Court on a routine remand hearing when he gave the signal to his brother Russell and a couple of mates who were in the public gallery. They all started attacking all the police officers in the court and Pat, after getting a few kicks in himself, vaulted over the dock and made a dash for the door. There was a motorbike waiting for him outside. He jumped on it and vanished. He buggered off to Spain and was doing fine for a few weeks when he made the mistake of visiting Gibraltar. He got re-arrested at the border and was brought back a few weeks later. Tate also used to do a lot of armed robberies on jewellery shops. He always had lots of girlfriends and used to give them all sorts of chains and rings and things to keep them sweet. He ended up in court over it once and this ex of his got up and started giving evidence against him. He shouted over the dock, 
One more word and I'll fucking kill you. And she decided she said enough. For some reason though, it never went any further. It was a bit weird with Pat. He seemed to have got away with a lot for no good reason. Some of the stories about what he'd done in the past didn't quite add up, but no one seemed to be bothered. We were too busy having a good time to take much notice. In fact, I had such an easy time inside, there was no way it was going to pop me off committing another crime. If I'd gone there and it had been absolutely fucking horrendous, I would have never even considered re-offending. But because I went there, did the time, made some friends and had a big laugh, it didn't bother me. It made the whole thing into a bit of a game. It meant that when I did see it wrong, the last thing on my mind was going back to prison. The only thing I cared about was making sure that I wasn't going to risk going away again. To make sure it was something a bit more profitable than counterfeit money. You see films like Midnight Express, but they hose the inmates down and people get beaten up by the guards. And I'm sure that for some people, it's like that. But where I was, there was people literally desperate to get in. There used to be these stories about when it gets to Christmas time, all sorts of tramps and people throw bricks through windows, and then stand around waiting to get arrested. And when they do, they tell the magistrates to fuck off, just to make sure they get sent to prison. Well, it really happens. I met loads of them. They'd talk about the fact they got fed, and it was warm, and they could have a good time. And as far as I was concerned, they were right. We actually had some people, real villains, who didn't want to leave. I remember one bloke on a landing who actually started crying when he was granted parole, begging the screws to let him stay. He was going, I've made so many friends. I'll never make friends like it again. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I was saying to him, mate, you're getting out. You can get on with your life. Just fuck off and enjoy it. In the end, they let him stay for the weekend so we could watch the football team from his unit playing all the others. At first I thought it was crazy, but pretty soon I sort of knew how it felt. As far as I was concerned, the friendships that were made in prison were going to last for life. You spend so much time talking, so much time together, sharing, helping, all that kind of thing. You can't help but get attached to people. We spent virtually the whole time laughing and joking and saying this was the way every prison should be. And like the guy didn't want to leave, it was this little part of me that hoped it would never end. Even though I knew it would have to one day. A few months on, John Wombs was caught smuggling one of the many Chinese meals into prison and was shipped out to High Point. A few weeks later, Pat followed him, mainly because the screws were shit scared of him because of his size and because he was getting more and more out of control. He was still nice to me and the others. A couple of months after he left, around May 1993, Mick received parole. Then finally Jack and Fran got to the end of their sentences and were allowed to go home. And that was the end of our little gang. I still had seven months to go before my sentence ended. And suddenly, I felt like my world had ended. I was all alone. When I'd first been sentenced, I was getting letters from family and friends on a regular basis, but the novelty soon began to wear off. The only letter I got in the last few months was from Mick. It was only because he'd lost a circuit diagram that I'd drawn up for him. I was finally released on the 17th of May 1994. I'd made a few calls the night before, but none of my so-called friends wanted to pick me up from prison. I think they were afraid that somebody might see us together, or they'd be tied with the same brush as me. In the end, it was Jack Wombs who drove over and took me back to Essex. Once I was back on the outside, I started off working for my younger brother Graham, laying patios and doing landscape work in gardens. Before I went away, we'd always been pretty close, but when I got out, we just argued all the time. It was unbearable. It turned out that he never wanted me to work for him in the first place, but my mum had put him under a bit of pressure. Got to look after your own and all that. I ended up quitting after a few weeks. I tried setting up businesses on my own, but just couldn't find any customers. I didn't have any recent references, and it all got a bit tricky when they asked what I'd been up to for the last couple of years. In July, another one of my brothers, Jonathan, asked me to work with him. Again, there was huge arguments within the family. His wife and father-in-law weren't happy about him employing someone who had a criminal record. As far as they were concerned, I couldn't be trusted. I finally got work with a friend of mine, Ricky. The days were long and the money wasn't much good but I enjoyed the work and we'd become close friends. It's a shame. If the money had been better, I think I'd have managed to stay on the straight and narrow but as it was, I knew that I was still the same person that I always was. If the right opportunity came along, I'd be tempted all over again. I heard on the grapevine that Pat Tate had been released from prison and that someone had shot him. So remembering what a great bloke he was, I rang Mick Steele to see if I could get a number for him. I finally got through to Pat on his mobile. He'd taken it with him into hospital and he seemed really pleased to hear from me. I arranged to go and visit him the next day, taking four bottles of lager as a kind of well done for not being dead present. 
just before I left, I happened to mention it to a friend who also knew Pat, but not too well, that I was going to see him. He told me to say hello, and remembering Pat's obsession with building his body, I asked if I could find out if he had any steroids for sale. I was really looking forward to seeing Pat again, but within about 30 seconds of getting to the hospital, I realised that it just wasn't the bloke I used to know. He was really arrogant, noisy, and right off his face on something or other. There was this young girl there, couldn't have been more than 16, and right in front of her he started saying to me, Here Darren, this is Lisa. She's just here to give me a blowjob, so I'd have to bother my girlfriend when she comes to visit me. Do you want one? She doesn't mind. She does it for a living. She's fucking good at it. Then he started ordering her about, sending her off to get cups of tea and that, treating her like she was a bit of dirt or something. I'd heard he was running a load of young prostitutes down in South End, and I guess they'd brought one along. Once she was away, he started going on about how he was going to set up Nipper Ellis and kill him, and how people were smuggling drugs into the hospital, so he didn't have to go without. It's like a fucking party in here every night. You should come by again later. My mate Tony will be here. I'd fucking love the two of you to meet. When I mentioned the mutual friend who wanted the steroids, Pat suddenly got really excited. How much does he need? You tell him as much as he wants, I can get them for him. I can get fucking truckloads. Does he just want steroids? I can get the lot. Ease, Wiz, Charlie, Puff. Tell him no matter how much he needs, I can get it. I'm the man. Maybe it was the drugs he'd taken. Maybe it's because I hadn't seen him in such a long time that I'd forgotten what he was really like. Or maybe getting shot in the arm had affected his brain. Either way, the bloke in the hospital wasn't the Pat Tate I remembered. He'd gone from nice bloke to total wanker. Later that day, Mick rang me up and asked me to go over to his bungalow in Angus Green as he had some work for me. I'd spoken to Mick a couple of times since I'd been released, bumped into him once, but this was the first time I'd had a chance to catch up properly. We were standing in his kitchen and he'd asked if I'd seen Pat and what I thought of him. Listen Mick, I said, no offence right, because I know the guy's your friend and all that, but I really didn't like him. It wasn't the same Pat I met at Hollandsey Bay. He seems to have turned into a bit of an arsehole. Mick just laughed, then asked if I'd mind going over to his mum's house in Point Clear to have a look at essential heating, which was playing up. Once we got there, it was obvious the whole thing needed to be replaced, and Mick paid me to do the work. We spent a lot of time chatting over the next few days, and in some stupid way, it was a bit like being back inside. I felt like we were becoming mates all over again. I was seeing quite a bit of Mick now, and would often drop in on him if I was in the area. About a week after Pat had gone back to prison, Mick called me up and asked me to go around to see him. I found him at Tate's house, where he was building a low wall and laying a driveway in the front, just as a favour to his friend. Mick said he had something to show me, and we both went to sit in the front of his car. He then pulled a bar of cannabis resin out from my bag and asked whether I thought I could sell it for him. Now, believe it or not, I'd never touched cannabis in my life. My wife smoked it all the time, but I'd never even tried it. I was always more of a drinker than anything else. I told Mick that I really didn't think I could do anything, but he told me to take it away and so I got on. If I had no luck, I could just give it back to him. If I did sell it, however, it was down to me to fix the price. Mick wanted £600 for the bar. Anything else I made was mine to keep. As I was leaving, Mick explained that Pat Tate had been working on some drug importations and now he'd gone back inside. He'd asked Mick to look after them. If I did manage to sell the stuff, there was plenty more available. I went back to Braintree, made a couple of calls and a couple of appointments, and that was it. I had become a drug dealer. Not only that, I seemed to be pretty good at it. It turned out that virtually everyone I knew either smoked dope or knew someone who wanted some. Once I'd popped the word around, people started coming out of the woodwork all over the place. I'd let them try a little bit, and once they realised it was good stuff, they would all buy some. I sold a lot within a couple of hours and made around £200 profit. Any doubts or dilemmas I had about getting involved in the drug trade vanished the moment I felt the money in my hand. I took Mick at his word so far as the supplies were concerned and went to see him the next day. And the next. And the next. I'd been hinting to Mick that I wanted some kind of active role once he was back in the drug smuggling business. Selling the stuff had shown me how easy it was to make money at the end and I knew the profits from smuggling were going to be much higher. Mick seemed to be doing really well out of it and I wanted some of what he had. I told him I wasn't interested in doing anything too heavy, just think to earn some extra money. Prison certainly didn't scare me anymore, so I felt like I had nothing to lose. But Mick had some doubts. He was worried about the fact that I'd never been abroad before. I'd only got a passport for the first time in my life about a month earlier, and I planned to use it on one of those cheap day trips to France, but I hadn't got around to it yet. Mick had pretty much decided he was going to at least start off with his usual team, but then fate lent me a helping hand. 
A guy called Paul Gwennett was under arrest for breaching a warrant banning him from entering Belgium. He'd been caught out by a routine customs check as he was getting off the boat, and they discovered he was the subject of a 10-year ban. It all meant that the gang was one man short for the trip, so Mick called on me. My first job was to pick up Mick from his home in Anglers Green. I arrived in my battered old VW Golf, expecting to head straight out for the coast, but he gave me directions to a pub near Clacton. As we pulled up, I saw a bloke standing in the car park wave at Mick and make his way over. He was in his 40s, about 6 foot tall, with graying hair. He actually looked a bit like a slimmer version of Mick, sort of like a younger brother, but without any of the charisma. He sat in the back and was introduced to me as Peter, but he didn't say very much. I remembered that I had a bag with him and he seemed really nervous, but that was about it. I remembered that Mick used to talk about a Peter Curry that he used to smuggle drugs with, so I assumed this must be the guy. But it didn't seem the time or place to start asking questions, so I just drove. As we made our way to Folkestone to catch the ferry, Mick told me he wanted me to go to Amsterdam with him to meet Dopey Harris, his main contact over there. Because with Gwennett in prison, I'd been making the trips over there to complete the first stage in the smuggling process. All I had to do was pick up the drugs in Amsterdam, have negotiated a good price, then drive them over to Belgium. There was no border in between the two countries, so I didn't have to worry about being stopped unless I did something really stupid, or unless I was just plain unlucky. Once in Belgium, Mick would meet me at the beach in his boat. I'd load the drugs in, and he'd set off back to England. After that, I'd be free to make my way back on the ferry, and even if I did get stopped and searched, there'd be nothing to incriminate me. I have to admit it, it sounded like a pretty good plan, and the £2,000 a time he promised me for the work sounded even better. We got to Folkestone, Mick pulled out a bundle of cash from his bag to cover the cost of the tickets. How much you got in there anyway, I said, as a joke really. Mick looked at me. 80 grand. He said it so casually, I tried not to sound like I'd never seen that much money before in my life. Alright, drinks on you then. He had to fill in some personal details on the form for the ferry tickets. I went to put his name down, but he stopped me. My name's too well known around the customs people. Just put your name down. We got a cabin on the boat and chatted about nothing in particular until we got bored of each other and got a bit of sleep. We finally got to Ostend in the early hours of the morning, and I drove all the way to Amsterdam along the coast road. By the time we pulled into the centre of the city and Mick told me where to park, I was absolutely knackered. We walked to Stone's Calf, which is on the road that runs parallel to the dam rack, and is nearly opposite a police station. When we arrived, Dopey Harris wasn't there, and we waited in the bar. Amsterdam is a weird place anyway. And all the coffee bars like Stones where you can legally buy and smoke small amounts of cannabis are weirder still. They're usually full of French and British students stoned out their brains, even at 9 in the morning. This place was just the same with loads of people giggling and the air thick with that funny pong. But what made Stones different was that it was also full of groups of English blokes just like us. And in every group there would be one bloke holding a bag, just a bit too carefully. And slowly I realised that everyone was waiting for Dopey Harris who got his name because of his business interests, not because he was thick, to go off and do a deal. Harris was a friend of the cafe owners and hung out there when he wasn't dealing, so he liked to meet all his contacts there. Don't think the owner had a clue what was going on. Harris invited us all to a flat close to the cafe. The place was full of masses of video equipment with loads of cameras trained on the door and stairway. Apart from that, the room was very basic, with one large table, one corner sofa, a couple of chairs and a ski machine for exercising. Apart from drug deals, it didn't look like much else went on there. Behind the smiles and the chirpy conversation, you could see that both Harris and Mick were being cautious, sizing each other up, wondering how much they could trust the other. But slowly, the tension eased and they started to get more familiar with each other. We all sat around drinking coffee and chatting about drugs and exchange rates because everything there was bought in guilders. He also explained that he had no drugs to buy and could not say when there might be some as there was currently a shortage across the whole of Amsterdam. He simply didn't know whether it would be soon or not. Mick decided he couldn't take the money back with him to England, so he decided to leave it with Harris. I guess he trusted the guy completely by then. It was left that Harris would contact Mick, and then I would go over and do the deal with Harris to ensure the exchange rate was correct. After we'd finished talking proper business, the conversation dried up, so we decided to leave. I was still knackered from driving through the night, so Peter volunteered to take over the wheel. Rather than going back the way we came, Mick was really keen on the idea of coming back through the Channel Tunnel, so we headed off towards Calais. I was well up for it, and neither Mick or Peter had been through the tunnel before, so it was something we were all looking forward to. I went to the duty-free shop at the terminal and bought some perfume for the wife. 
and a case of lager for myself, while Peter and Mick stocked up on cigarettes. When we finally got on the train, I was still really tired, so I decided to have a quick nap before we set off. Mick woke me up at Dover. I'd missed the whole thing. I'd always believed that bad things happen in threes, so that was number one. As we drove back from Dover to the Dartford Tunnel, it became very clear what number two would be. The petrol gauge on the Gulf was getting pretty close to empty. I suggested we stop off and fill up, but Mick was really keen to get home. He insisted that he'd worked out what mileage we'd done. There were still loads left, no matter what the gauge said. We hit the A12 to Ipswich and passed another petrol station. Keep going, they said, keep going. Then we passed the Brentwood garage. Keep going, they said, keep going. And we did, for at least a mile, until we ran out of petrol and ground to a halt. That's two, I thought to myself. It was pitch black and freezing cold as I walked along the A112 back to the Brentwood garage. I didn't have a petrol can in the car, so I had to buy one, fill it up and trudge back. I kept trying to cage a lift, but no one stopped, so I just kept on walking. Then my mobile went off. It was Mick. We can see you, he said. You're about half a mile away, but you're getting closer all the time. His voice sounded really strange. Then Mick then burst into a massive laughing fit and put the phone down. About 10 minutes later, he phoned again and did the same thing. I've got my binoculars and I can see you coming towards us, he said, before collapsing in a fit of giggles again. I didn't find it funny at all. Couldn't work out why Mick was behaving in such a strange way. It was really out of character. It's not so much the guy didn't have a sense of humour. It's just that he was always so serious. It was only when I got back to the car that I found out why they were so happy. They'd got so bored of waiting around, they'd broken into my cases of lager and drunk the lot. That was free. I was pissed off in a major way really tempted to tell them to cough and to find their own way back. But I was also only too aware that in the next week or so, Mick was offering me the chance to earn £2,000 for 18 hours work. So I drove them home. I didn't get back myself until well after 10 that morning and had to go straight to bed. In less than 30 hours, I'd gone from having never been abroad in my life to having been on a ferry through three European countries and the Channel Tunnel. As far as I was concerned, I was a seasoned traveller. I'd actually really enjoyed it. A couple of days later, Mick rang to say the drugs were ready to be picked up. It was time to go abroad again. This time, I decided to take my Peugeot 405 because I thought it would be a lot more comfortable. I drove over to Mick's and then followed him in his car to a pub where we'd met Peter Corey the first time round. The three of us then went to a cash point in Clacton where Mick took out £250, money to cover our expenses. Peter went for a piss, nerves probably, and Mick took the opportunity to take me to one side and explained that even though he'd given me the marina radio to contact me when we got close to the coast, Peter was in charge. After all, Peter had made the same trip dozens of times and knew exactly what he was doing. If there was any problems, I should do exactly what Peter said. And if there weren't any problems, then I should do what Peter said anyway. Unfortunately, the only thing that Mick didn't tell me about Peter was that he was a total prat. As we drove down to Folkestone, he kept going on about what a big man he was, and how people across Clacton where he lived were really scared of him. It was like he was trying to do it to impress me for no reason. After all, I was just there to do a job of work, the same as him. But it was all, if you're ever in Clacton, just mention my name and you'll be alright. It's my town. I've virtually run the place. It was another overnight ferry, so we took a cabin, which gave Peter the chance to get on my nerves at right close up. He spent the whole journey saying things like, if we get stopped by the police, tell them I'm a hitchhiker you've just picked up. Basically, his attitude was that if we got caught out, I should take the blame for everything so we can go back and explain the situation to Mick. Peter was so anxious about being able to use the hitchhiker excuse that he refused to drive the whole time. Then, on the way to Amsterdam, the radiator sprung a leak, giving him another chance to panic. We couldn't find a garage anywhere and we were running low on diesel as well. In the end, we parked up on a garage forecourt at about 5 in the morning and got a couple of hours sleep while we waited for it to open. Having sorted out the radiator and filled it up, we finally got into Amsterdam proper at 10am and met Toby Harris. We agreed a price of 1,150 per kilo, which gave us just under 70 kilos of top quality cannabis resin. The drugs themselves weren't kept at the calf, so we had to wait for them to be brought to us. One of Harris's business partners pulled up outside the calf in a brand new Merc about three hours later with the drugs in his boot. Rather than just taking him there and then, I asked him to guide me to the main road out of the city so I didn't end up driving around in circles for hours. Once I knew where I was, he pulled over 
and we swapped the drugs over from the boot of his car to mine, and then I set off towards Belgium. We only made one stop on the way, at a payphone to call Mick, and let him know that we was on our way to Blankenburg. He had a four hour journey across the English Channel, and wasn't particularly keen to leave, unless he knew we definitely had the goods. I could hear the excitement in his voice as I told him everything was fine, and that we'd meet up with him as planned. It was the first time he'd done any proper smuggling since he'd been sent to prison back in 1990. As far as he was concerned, the good old days were back again. We made really good time and got to Blankenberg about three hours early. The area had been chosen because it had a perfect ready-made smuggling spot that Mick had taken advantage of many times in the past. If you stand on the pier and look out to sea, on your left is a beautiful 10 mile long sandy beach. On your right, there are three or four really ugly great concrete pipes, which take sewage or something into the sea. The pipes stick out of the water a good few feet, and Mick was planning to bring the boat up to the second pipe on the right. That way, it'd be hidden from the beach and the pier. Up until now, I've been podding up with Peter, mostly by ignoring him, just going off into my own little world. But once we'd gotten into Blankenburg, he became completely impossible to deal with. I said we should just go to the main car park by the beach, like every other person in the area was doing, waited till it got dark, and near the rendezvous time, take the drugs from the boat and head from the water. But he wanted to treat the whole thing like some big military operation. Park miles away, walk to the beach to check the coast was clear, then walk back for the drugs. But the problem was with that, we'd park so far away, we had no idea if the coast would still be clear by the time we got the drugs. It was stupid, but that's the way we did it, because Peter was in charge. One long walk later, Peter decided it was time to drive close to the beach and take the drugs out. He changed into his waterproofs. He'd be going back in the boat with Mick. And we took the drugs and hid ourselves in some grassy sand dunes about 200 yards from the waterline. We were sitting there in the dark with his three sports bags stuffed full of cannabis. And people were walking right by us. He was taking the dogs out for a walk or going for a cold swim. None of them seemed to be paying us much attention though. We had the marina band walkie talkie turn to channel 14. The idea was to wait until the allotted time and then switch it on. Once we confirmed Mick was there, we'd thrust a torch to give him a bearing. He was navigating in the dark using this miniature satellite link, but it was only accurate to within about 20 meters, so we still needed guidance for the final approach. There were a couple of minutes to go and Peter turned on the radio. All we got was some fishermen muttering in French. That sent the big man from Clacton off into a right panic trying to explain that it probably just meant that Mick was still a little far out. Once he got nearer, he'd override the other signal. He'd stress that we should always wait for him to call rather than give the game away, until there were drugs in his boat, he'd always be able to bluff his way out of trouble by saying he was fishing or something, so if anything went wrong, it was important there was no link between the three of us, otherwise we'd all get done for smuggling. So we waited, and waited, and waited. When it got to 15 minutes past the meeting time, Peter was practically having kittens. I tell you what we're going to do, he said. We're going to take the bags and we're going to move down the beach. I couldn't believe it. No way, I told him. No way am I moving from this well-hidden bit of grass to sit on a beach like a fucking idiot with 80 grand's worth of dope on my lap. But Peter was unstoppable. He grabbed one of the bags and made off. Just then, the radio crackled into life. Sparky, Sparky, are you there? It was Mick using my call sign. Zulu Tango, X-Ray Tango, receiving you loud and clear, I replied. Mick then asked me to give him the signal. I shouted for Peter to stay still and flashed the torch a couple of times. The radio crackled into life one last time. Gotcha, Mick said. After a minute or so, I could hear the boat's engine, so I grabbed the bags. It turned out that Peter had left me with the two heavy ones and headed down to the water. I met Peter down by the sea and we soon saw the silhouette of the boat come into view. We packed all the drugs in and then Peter climbed on board. Mick turned to me, a big grin on his face. Call Jack, tell him it's all gone to plan. But we're 20 minutes late. The boat had come so far into shore that it had virtually been grounded. I had to push it back into the sea and the water was coming up to my chest. I pushed the boat as hard as I could but it just couldn't seem to break free of the waves that were pushing it back to shore. Then suddenly, the propeller caught and it shot off into the darkness. I was soaking wet and walked slowly back to the car where I changed into my tracksuit bottoms and trainers. It was absolutely freezing and so was the water, but I was so worked up from the adrenaline, I couldn't feel the cold at all. 
I was shaking, but it was all with excitement. All my fear and nerves had gone, and all I could think of was, fuck, I've done it. I've got away with it. I've got to admit, it was a great feeling. Blankenberg is just down the road from Ostend, but when I arrived there a little later that evening, I discovered I'd missed the last ferry. The next one wasn't until 7am, which meant I wouldn't get home until the middle of the afternoon. I didn't fancy that. I knew there was a ferry at 2.30am from Calais, and looking at the map, it didn't seem that far, so I decided to drive there. When I reached the French-Belgian border, I got pulled over by one of the guards and asked where I was going. They searched my car and found my wet clothes in the boot and asked what I'd been up to. I was feeling confident and cocky. After all, there was nothing at all to link me with any sort of drug smuggling. I had nothing to fear. I told the guard that I'd been playing around in the sea earlier that day and I'd missed the last ferry home from Ostend. So I decided to go back via Cali so that I'd still be home the following morning. He looked a bit suspicious but checked my passport ran my name through the computer and let me go. I got to Cali and on my way to the boat got pulled over by French customs. Fucking hell, I said. I've already been searched once tonight. The guy's face didn't even break a grin, let alone a smile. Not by me, you haven't. He proceeded to give the car a really good going over, but of course, couldn't find anything. So he let me go on the boat. I tried to get to sleep on the ferry, but I couldn't because the crossing was so rough. Once we got to Dover, the only thing on my mind was getting back home and going to bed as quickly as possible. I drove the car off through customs, and as Soz Law would have it, I got pulled over again. I was so tired, just so totally exhausted that I couldn't handle it. I freaked out. I was swearing, shouting, and gone about the fact that I must have some sort of guilty sign stamped on my forehead, because I'd been pulled over twice already. In the end, I think they felt sorry for me. They just photocopied my passport and let me go home. The next day was even more exciting, payday. I'd already been planning what I was going to spend the money on and I was really looking forward to seeing those notes in my greedy little hands. I got there and told Mick I was there to pick up my wages. He went into the boot of his car and then laid a bar in my hands. What the fuck's that? I said. It's a kilo of puff, he said. Over here, that's worth 2,200. That's your wages, apart from the 200 which you now owe me. F-U-C-K. This was not the way things were supposed to happen. One of the main reasons I wanted to get involved in the actual smuggling operation was so that I wouldn't have to sell drugs anymore because it was such a pain in the ass lugging the stuff around town and then getting the money off people. But thanks to Mick, I was right back to where I started. I had to be very careful about who I sold to and never wanted it to get out of control and had a large number of visitors each day from my wife's large family, friends and the people I employed. I was only too aware of the fact that I fitted the profile of a typical drug dealer. I had several cars, albeit all of them old and tatty. I seemed to live beyond my means, and that was even before I started to actually be one. But selling to people that you knew made it harder to keep it as a proper business. I was giving people credits and discounts. The money was coming in dribs and drabs. I'd expected to have £2,000 in my hand and be able to buy a decent car or something. Instead, I had a few quid here and a few quid there and a load of hassle. On paper, I was doing well, but I had no idea how long I was going to have to wait for the money to come in, so I was pretty stuck. As soon as I found out we were off again, I went out and bought a pair of chest waders. I'd got really soaked the last time from trying to push the boat out to sea. I didn't want it to happen again. Over the next few days, I kept asking Mick who would be in the boat with him. The whole scam about coming back into the harbour, having dumped the drugs off, relies on having at least two people in the boat. You can hardly claim to be out diving on your own, can you? Mick said he was sorting it out. The day before we were due to set off, Mick called me up on my mobile and said he couldn't find anyone to come into the boat with him, so would I do it? He could tell I wasn't so keen, so he launched into this big thing to try and convince me. He was going on about how he wanted to expand the business, how he wanted to go back to using two boats. Now he needed someone who would be able to cross across the channel on their own. Basically, he was saying he wanted me to experience it so that I could see if I liked it. And if I did, that's where the real money was. It'd be worth your while, Darren. Promise. Either I was blinded by greed or just felt in a generous mood. I said yes. The next day, Mick gave me £70,000 and gave me strict instructions to try and get grass rather than resin, even though it was bulkier and a lot harder to handle. There was, of course, method in his madness. Mick charged £300 per kilo to import drugs. It didn't matter what he was importing. That was the amount he charged. Because grass was a bit cheaper per kilo than resin, 
it meant that we could come back with an extra 30 or so kilos, which meant that Mick earned an extra £9,000 for taking exactly the same risk. Clever boy, old Mick. I took my friend Christian and we took the overnight ferry from Felix Day to Zeebrugge and then drove to Amsterdam. Mick told me he'd phoned Dopey Harris a couple of days earlier to tell him to expect me. So when I got to Dubai and he wasn't around, I knew he'd be on his way. Harris arrived on his push bike around 10am, looking a bit mean and serious, guided me to the flat upstairs above the bar and then started tearing into me. He was ranting and raving about the fact that Mick was going to get us all arrested, that he was not being careful enough on the phone and make it too obvious what he was doing. That loud mouth fucker is going to get us arrested one day, he said. For a bloke with his kind of background and experience, he doesn't have to run his mouth off. When you get back, you tell him to watch what he says, otherwise he's going to have to find himself another supplier. Once the bollocking was out of the way, we got down to business. We agreed a price for the grass, then Harris asked me what car I was driving and where I'd parked it. I told him, then he asked for the keys. Now, now piss off and enjoy yourself for a couple of hours, he told me. When we got back, the car was in the same place. I went to see Harris and he told me everything was fine and gave me back my keys. And that was that. We set off for a bit and stopped down a side street and checked the boot. Three nylon laundry bags full of grass. So I called Mick's mobile and told him we are on our way and headed back to Blankenburg. Mick and the boat arrived at the rendezvous at dusk, sticking out like a sore thumb because it wasn't as dark as it was the time before. But Christian and I loaded the boat and got in. I was trying to pretend that I was really cool about it, but the truth was I was really excited about being in the boat at long last. I was a bit pissed off that I'd missed out the sea trials, but I was hoping this would be more than make up for it. I wasn't disappointed. When we sped off, it was the most incredible sensation. There was lots of noise and spray flying up all over the place, and because we were so low down, it felt like we were going a million miles an hour. Mick was in the front, and I was directly behind him. The sea was really calm, as flat as a pancake, and in the half light you could see for miles. It was like being on some gigantic pond. Absolutely fantastic. After about 10 minutes, when we were well out of sight of Blankenberg Beach, Mick stopped the boat and started fishing around in a bag. Here, put this on, he said, handing me a buoyancy aid. The weather's not too clever ahead, so you better wear it. Unfortunately, I've only got the one life jacket and I'm wearing it. As I put the buoyancy aid on, I had a good look at Mick. I saw as well as the life jacket, he was wearing a full dry suit, proper boating clothing. He also had a safety line attached to the console, so if he fell in, he wouldn't end up separated from the boat. If I fell in, my waders would have filled it with water, and I'd have sunk to the bottom in seconds. All I could do was hold on and pray. We set off again, and Mick told me that rather than sitting down, I should straddle the seat directly behind him. That way, if the boat left the water for a second and came down with a bang, my legs would act like suspension springs. After about half an hour, the land behind me was vanishing fast. And so was my excitement about my first ever trip in a rib. The waves were getting quite rough now, and we were bouncing up and down like a trampoline. We are starting off speeding along about 33 knots, but now we were down to about 12. I decided the best policy was just to keep my eyes shut and use my ears instead. I knew that when I heard the engine note change, the boat had come out of the water and the whole thing was airborne. That was my signal to hold on extra tight and brace myself for the landing. I was concentrating really hard, but one time, I don't know, I must have just lost my focus for a second because I slipped and nearly fell over the side. That's when I started to get really scared. I was just about to ask Mick to slow down even more when I heard the engine roar again. I braced myself, but this time when the boat landed, it hit a wave that was traveling sideways and rolled right over to one side. I fell and just managed to grab the edge to stop myself going over. I was rolling all over the place and I was bawling like a baby until Mick stopped to have a look at what was going on. I was really shaken. I was really convinced that I was going to die, that I was going to fall out of the boat and Mick would be miles away by the time he realised and not be able to find me before I went under. We set off again, this time a bit more slowly and with me holding on tighter than ever, but I'd already decided there was no way I was going to be making this trip again. How far is it across, Mick? I asked. About 70 miles. 70 miles? Fuck it now. I always thought the channel was about 22 miles wide. Only between Dover and Calais, Mick explained. Not between Blankenberg and Point Clear. Okay, well tell me when we're halfway. Why? Just tell me when we're halfway. Then about half an hour later. Okay, Darren, we're halfway across now. Why the fuck are you so interested anyway? 
Well, if I do fall in, I want to know which way to swim. Slowly, the weather started to improve. Star started to play, I'll be there yet, Dad. I'd see lights and say, hey, look over there, Mick. Is that land? No, it's a boat. Five minutes later, how about that? Is that land? No, that's a boat too. Then I saw a white flashing light. That wasn't land either, but some kind of marker buoy, which meant the shore was about 12 miles away. I was starting to feel much better and much braver. The big waves had all gone and were getting close to home. We were still going fairly slowly, so I was actually starting to enjoy myself when I fell over again. I stood up for a minute, but then I fell again. I just couldn't seem to get a grip properly with my feet. My first thought was that we must have sprung a leak and the boat had started shipping water. I tapped Mick on the shoulder and pointed to the floor. We stopped, switched on a torch and saw immediately that the main fuel tank had split. We couldn't see the actual hole, but we could see the fuel slowly leaking out. Naturally, I started to panic. After all, I didn't have Mick's experience. This was all new to me. What really freaked me out was that the fact that Mick started to panic as well. He said we'd have to sit on the seats, even though it was more dangerous and made the boat less stable. And we'd have to go as fast as possible to make sure we hit the shore before we ran out of fuel altogether. He reprogrammed the GPS so that we headed for the nearest point of land rather than point clear. If we could get close enough, he explained, then Jack Worms, his backup man for all his new smuggling ventures, could always come out and get us in his speedboat. But if we ran out of fuel where we were, we'd have to call the Coast Guard and that would mean dumping £70,000 worth of drugs over the side. We were flying along, and I was absolutely terrified. Mick was trying to work out where we were, but the GPS was playing up. He reset it to read the depth of the water rather than the location, so we could try and work out how close we were. But somehow, he fucked it up. The whole screen went blank. So there we are, in the pitch black with no guidance system, totally fucking lost, and with a boat that's pissing away fuel going around and round in circles. Then Mick perked up and pointed some poxy little light he could see in the distance. He said it was definitely Clacton Pier, or maybe Walton Pier, and that he knew where we were probably. Either way, he reckoned we was only about four miles from the coast. I was gearing myself up to feel a bit more confident when, right on cue, the engine died and we ran out of fuel completely. We switched to the reserve tank, but that was empty too. We primed the carbs on the engine by hand and it started up went about 50 yards and then stopped again. We kept on doing it and had to rock the boat from side to side, the last thing I wanted to do, to try to get the last remaining splashes of fuel into the pipes. Then Mick managed to get the GPS working again. I don't know what he did. I didn't even think he knew what he did. I just heard him say, fuck me, it's working again. And at last, we were going in the right direction. We had to kangaroo hop all the way with the engine firing and dying every few yards. But when we got about half a mile from the spot where Jack was, we realised it was just about shallow enough for me to get out and push the boat to shore. So I did. I'd never been so happy to see Jack as I was when I saw him sitting on the beach waiting for us. I could have kissed him. He helped us drag the boat up to his Range Rover, and we started unloading the drugs. But the problems were far from over. The plan, as always, had been to unload the boat, then take it back out to sea, so we could come into Felix though and pretend we'd been out fishing or something. But with a split tank, there was no way that was going to happen. And the trailer was back at Jack's workplace, so we couldn't even move the boat. Mick and I were pacing around, telling Jack about our nightmare journey and trying to work out what the best thing to do was. We were so caught up in our own problems that we hardly heard Jack say there was a problem with the Range Rover. It turned out that Jack had driven it down on the beach and gone over a pole stuck in the ground, which had wedged in his axle. He was totally stuck. Mick was furious. Only a few minutes earlier, we'd radioed him and he told us it was safe to come into shore. What exactly is your definition of safe, Jack? Mick was saying. Because I don't think being stuck on a beach with no car, no boat, and with a load of drugs fits in with my definition of safe. We took the drugs out of the Range Rover and hid them a bit further at the beach. Mick then stormed off to his mum's house, which was about a mile away, to borrow her car. While he was gone, Jack and I set about trying to get the pole out of the axle, but didn't have any luck. Mick came back about 3am and took the drugs to go and hide in his mum's garage, so that was the main worry off our shoulders, and then went off to get a chainsaw to try and cut the pole. In the meantime, Jack and I tried a different technique, wedging bricks and stones underneath the wheels as they went into the air. It worked. By the time Mick came back, the Range Rover was free. 
Mick had to take his mum's car back and Jack was going to follow him and then take him up to Ipswich where the trailer was and then bring him back so he could get the boat off the beach. In the meantime, they wanted me to sit around and stand guard. Mick had picked up a few sandwiches and a drink from the garage, but I wasn't really in the mood for a picnic. I was fighting a losing battle to keep my eyes open and terrified that I'd drop off to sleep and the boat would be washed away. I ended up tying the rope from the boat around my ankle and I curled up on the stones and fell asleep. I woke up a bit later to find my feet in the water and the boat tugging at my leg. The tide was starting to come in. I dragged the boat up the beach and fell asleep again, only to be woken up by the water lapping at my feet once more. I was cold and miserable. I ached all over and I felt like I'd been there for days. It was getting light when they finally came back. Mick had a go at me for dragging the boat up on the rocks because I'd scratched the base, but I just didn't care. All I wanted to do was get home. Jack dropped him off at Mick's house and I borrowed his Renault to drive home. Then he'd fallen asleep at the wheel a couple of times. That meant that even though I was freezing cold, I had to drive with the window open. I was knackered by the time I'd finally got to bed. I didn't wake up to the middle of the afternoon and I took Mick's car straight back up to pick up my money. Once again, he paid me in drugs, explaining that he needed his cash to get the boat fixed. And he ripped me off again by only giving me just over two grand's worth of grass. He said the shipment wasn't as big as he planned, so he couldn't pay me more. But he'd make it up to me the next time. And don't forget, he said, you owe me £200 for the drugs. I sold it almost as quickly as I did the time before and was rapidly building up a reputation as a quality supplier. I took a load more orders, went round to Mix to pick up some more. Only there wasn't any. Part 8, along with Tony Tucker and Craig Rolfe, had worked out some deal and bought the whole lot in one go. I was trying my hand at running a business, repairing and selling fridges and freezers. Mick called me up and asked me how much it would be to replace the fridge in Sarah's new house. Because the one she had wasn't working. Depending on how much it was, he was going to buy it for her. But he told me not to tell Jackie that he was paying for it, or she wouldn't like it, if she thought she was spending their money on someone else. I told him it was best if I went and had a look, because I might be able to get it working. Jackie Street picks me up in her RAV4, and we met Mick, and then went over to Sarah's place. It didn't take too long to work out what the problem was. The fridge had been plugged into the cooker socket, so every time Sarah turned off the cooker, she turned off the fridge as well. It was around lunchtime and a couple of friends of Sarah's turned up to cheer her up with some bottles of wine. So we all sat about in the living room, chatting about Pat. The whole conversation revolved around how bad he was, how out of control he'd become, how much he'd changed. It turned out that when Pat found out her friend's boyfriend was helping Sarah to move out, he went completely mad. Even though he'd actually told her to leave, he somehow blamed this bloke for splitting the two of them up. Along with Tucker and Rolf, they went to track the bloke down. They basically kidnapped him off the streets and took him back to Pat's house where they held a knife to his throat and told him to snort six lines of coke. He tried to say no, but they made it pretty obvious that if he didn't do as they say, they would hurt him really badly. So he started snorting and they made him snort some more and more until basically the guy passed out. Once he was unconscious, they stripped all of his clothes off and started putting cigarettes out all over his body until he came round. Then they made him snort some more coke until he passed out and then burned him until he came round again. After a while, Tucker and Rolf were getting bored They said they thought the bloke had had enough. But Tate wasn't having it. He was like a man possessed. He kept waking the bloke up and making him snort more and more until they eventually ran out of drugs. Then Tate took the bloke in the boot of his car and dumped him in the front of the garden of his house. When the bloke's girlfriend came home, she found him rolling around naked in the living room, covered in burns and gasping for air. He had so much powder up his nostrils that he couldn't breathe through them. He had no idea what was going on or who he was. He was in a total state, just crying constantly. They had really broken him. He ended up in a psychiatric unit for three days. When he got out, surprise, surprise, he decided not to press charges. Sarah was upset by the whole thing, but I was surprised to see that Mick was almost in tears himself. He kept saying that he couldn't believe how someone he had once considered such a good friend had changed so much. He'd get more and more angry every time Sarah mentioned something new that Pat had done to her. He seemed to be taking it really personally. Eventually, he walked over to Sarah and gave her a big hug. It was a whole new side of him. I just got in from cleaning the car when the phone rang. It was Mick being all weird and casual. He said he was having a few friends around for a drink that afternoon at Angler's Green and why didn't I pop over? 
Oh, and could I bring my fishing gear with me? Because he wanted to borrow it. So I gathered up my waders, a change of clothing, and my passport, and said goodbye to my wife. I knew we were on for another run. I drove over in my Sirocco, parked in the driveway, and then walked up the path. Mick met me at the door and ushered me into the living room, where I saw Jack Worms and Peter Corey already sitting down chatting. The other thing that caught my eye was this enormous pile of money on the coffee table, a pile so big that, depending on where you sat, you couldn't actually see some of the other people around the table, but no one mentioned it. The others nodded hello, and Mick told me to get myself a drink. Walked over to the fridge, got myself some beer, and came and sat with the others, so the pile was blocking out Corey. Then we all started talking about this and that, until the conversation died down, and suddenly Mick grabbed a pile of money off the table and started clicking through it. And then, Jack and Peter started doing the same. Then Mick said to me, Don't just sit there like a prat, Darren. Grab some money and start counting. It turned out it wasn't such a big pile after all. It was several small piles all gathered together. There was supposed to be £76,000 from Part 8 and friends, £28,000 for some friend of Mick's from down south, £14,000 from Jack Wombs, and Mick had put in a little bit himself to make up a total of 124000 But nothing was taken on trust. We each had to count each person's money and hand it on to someone else for checking. I don't think anyone was particularly surprised when Pat's bundle turned out to be £200 short. Mick wrote a note to himself so he'd remember to subtract the difference from the amount of drugs he gave to Pat. Then we bundled all the cash into a bag so that Corey and I could get on our way. Although Corey hadn't put any money into the deal, Mick once again insisted on giving me the big speech about how, if there were any decisions to be made, Corey should make them, because he was the experienced one. Then, just like before, he gave me, rather than Corey, the radio. What do you reckon the weather will be like for crossing this time, Mick? I asked. He shrugged. All right, I suppose. Certainly not as bad as the last time we came over. That wasn't what I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear that it was going to be the worst crossing ever. That Corey was going to hate every minute of it. Well, I said, I'll keep my fingers crossed for the two of you. The plan this time was that Corey and I would take the ferry over as a couple of foot passengers and hire a car once we got to Amsterdam. Although there's no real border between Amsterdam and Belgium, Mick was always concerned that a British car driving between the two was far more likely to be stopped than a local one. As far as he was concerned, we'd been lucky up until then, but now he didn't want to take any more chances, especially as he'd gone over the magic £100,000 mark for the first time. On the way to Harwich, in the light of what Mick had said, I made the decision to make a real effort to get on with Corey, but somehow... He managed to start pissing me off almost straight away. When we got to the docks, he refused to buy the tickets because he didn't want to get seen by the cameras. And then he refused to carry the money through customs and insisted on walking through on his own 10 minutes after I'd gone through, just to be sure he could say he wasn't with me if it all came on top. I suppose the thing that really got to me was the way he spent so much of the time bragging about what a big man he was and how so many people were scared of him. The truth was... He was a spineless twat with no bottle, and I was lumbered with him. We got a cabin on the boat, and I left Corey there to look after the money, while I went off and had a few drinks in the bar, then went to the casino. I lost a fair bit of money, but I didn't care. I stayed there for the rest of the trip, just so I could avoid Corey. The next morning, paranoid Peter was living up to his name in full. He made sure that I carried the money through Dutch customs when we got off the ferry, and he stayed a little way behind me. And then he insisted that I book the train tickets in my name. And when the ticket inspector came along, he made sure it was me who had the money, just in case. But when we got within spitting distance of Stone's calf, he had a sudden change of heart. Give me the bag, he said. Huh? Eh? What for? Look, don't back about. You know I'm in charge here. Just give me the fucking bag. I didn't have the energy to argue. I thought, fuck it. If he wants to look like the big man, as if he's the one in charge of the money the whole time, let him. This time, Harris was waiting for us along with one of his Dutch partners when we got to the calf. I'd seen this other guy hanging around before. He was the one who led me out of the city the first time I brought the drugs from there. But this was the first time he'd actually been there whilst we were striking the deal. He didn't say anything the whole time. He just sat in the background, making me nervous. We wanted grass, but Harris checked with his partner, then said there wasn't any around. That seemed fair enough. After all, the first time we'd gone over, he didn't have anything at all. So we settled for resin. We fixed the price and I checked the exchange rate on Teletex. It worked out that we were getting the stuff for around 1,125 per kilo, roughly half what it would be worth once we got back to Britain. It was pretty much then that the problems began. Corey started getting the money out 
emptying his gear, including his dry suit, onto the floor. And Harris just looked over and said, oh, What's this? So as quick as a flash, I said it was a flying suit for the helicopter. Corey looked at me as if I was totally mad, like I'd lost the plot. Don't be soft, he said. It's my waterproof for the boat. He then looked at Harris and raised his eyes to the ceiling, like I was some sort of moron. I was still trying to think on my feet, trying to save the day. Yeah, I said, but they only use the boat if they're having a problem with the helicopter. But it's fine today. I'm no expert in the drug business. But one thing I do know is that you don't trust anybody and you don't tell anyone any more than they need to know. It's just too big a risk. And telling your supplier just how you're going to get the stuff out of the country is pretty fucking high up the list of things not to do. But that's just what Corey had done. We got to Blankenberg with a few minutes to spare, so I brought some bags from the supermarket across the harbour, and Corey and I started transferring the drugs over. In our rush to leave Amsterdam, I hadn't realised just how badly packed the drugs were. Even the individual blocks hadn't been wrapped up properly. The whole lot had just been thrown together, but there was no way any of it was going to be waterproof. Then Corey and I realised we'd run out of bags, and the shop we'd bought them from had shut for the evening. We ended up having to leave one load in the box. Not the best place to store something for a 70 mile trip across the sea, but we just didn't have any choice. By the time we finished, it was almost the rendezvous time, and Corey started taking charge again. He insisted on doing things by the book, parking about two miles away, and walking down to the beach to check the coast was clear, walking back to the car, and then bringing it a little closer. I just looked at him and shook my head. I'd already spent 24 hours too long in his company, and it was really starting to get to me. Whether he was in charge or not, I wasn't going to behave like a prat, unless it was absolutely necessary. Who the fuck do you think you are, I said to him. Secret squirrel. Look, we're parking here, and that's it. If the coast isn't clear, we'll see it from the car, and we can drive away. If you don't like it, you can just fuck right off. That pissed him off something rotten. So after we put our waterproofs on, started taking the bags down to the beach, he stormed off in a huff, and in the wrong direction. I pointed out that he was at the first concrete pipe and that the meeting place was at the second one. He looked at me with daggers in his eyes. Basically, he was so pissed off with me, he didn't want to agree about anything. If I'd have told him his name was Peter, he'd have wanted to have a row about it. No, it ain't. So it was the first one. I shook my head. No, it isn't. The reason it isn't, moron, is because if it was the first one, you'd be too close to the fucking pier. Darren, I think you're forgetting who's in charge. So I left it. By now, Mick was five minutes late and Corey was in quarter panic mode. We were sitting in a sand dune on this little mound of grass surrounded by bags of puff, looking out over the water, listening to the radio for Mick to come in. But he didn't, and there was nothing we could do apart from wait and wait. Fifteen minutes later, and Corey was in half panic mode. I was starting to feel a bit uncomfortable myself. There were all these people taking their dogs out for walks on the beach, passing within just a few yards of us each time. As they passed us, their dogs were going absolutely fucking mad for the drugs. I mean, these dogs were going crazy for the stuff, tearing at their leashes and barking like crazy. And all we could do was just sit there on our waterproofs with these dodgy looking bags and pretend we didn't know what was going on. And wait. And wait. Mick was now 25 minutes late, and Corey had missed out on the interim stage and gone into full panic mode. He grabbed one of the bags, the lightest one, surprise, surprise, and ran down to the water, desperately scanning the sea for any sign of Mick. Just then, the radio crackled to life. Sparky, come in Sparky. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, said Mick. Flash a torch. I did, and he told me that he couldn't see it. I flashed it again, and he still couldn't see it. Where the fuck are you? I'm at the beach, he yelled. I'm actually on the fucking sand. Where are you? I grabbed the other bags and dragged them down the beach, but still couldn't see Mick, let alone hear the boat. Corey was literally running around in circles and generally being useless, so I flashed the torch again. I see you, said Mick. You're in the wrong fucking place. You're fucking miles away. What are you doing there? Mick had, quite rightly, parked at the second concrete pipe, so Corey and I had to drag all the drugs about a quarter of a mile to where he was. There was no point in explaining. I knew that whatever I said, Corey had a good four hours to convince him that it was my fault. So I just pushed the boat out to sea and waved them goodbye. And good riddance. I thought I'd had more than enough excitement for one night. But unfortunately, it wasn't quite over yet. I'd parked the Toledo right next to this karate club, and when they saw some bloke in waders struggling to get into a car, my hands were freezing from the water, and I couldn't work the lock properly. They thought I was a car thief. The next thing I know, there was 25 massive blokes in judo suits running towards me, shouting out in French. 
I didn't have a clue what they were saying, but decided I wasn't going to hang around to find out. I got in the car and watched them grow small in the rearview mirror. What a night. I drove back to Amsterdam and got totally lost trying to find the car hire place, so in the end, I flagged down a cab and got him to drive me there so I could follow him. After that, I got the cab to drive me to the Delta Hotel. It was too late to get a ferry back to England. I fancied a few beers anyway, so I spent the night in Stone's Cuff talking bollocks and drinking myself into a stupor. By the time I got back to the hotel, I was shattered. I slept like a baby. It might have been a nightmare, but at least nothing else could go wrong. But how wrong I was. I switched on my mobile phone, as I thought I'd probably have a message from Mick or Jack, but there was nothing. I tried calling them on their mobiles, but couldn't get through. So I called Sandra and told her I was on my way back. I kept trying Jack and Mick on the way back to Braintree with no luck. So finally, I tried Mick at home. Jackie Street answered. Hi Darren, she went. Mick's not here at the moment. There's been a bit of a misunderstanding. He was out fishing in his boat and customs thought he was up to something. So they arrested him, going into Brighton Sea Marina. Everything's going to be okay though. Mick was a clever git. He knew only too well that somebody might be listening on the phone and he wasn't going to give anything away. By telling Jackie that everything was going to be okay, he was giving me a clear signal that the drugs had already been unloaded and that customs hadn't found anything. Mick didn't get home until really late that night, so I didn't get to see him until the next day. Customs had held onto the Range Rover and boat for forensic examination and I wanted to get the full story. With a big grin on his face, he explained that once they'd unloaded the drugs and stashed them safely in Mick's mum's garage, they decided to get the boat out at Brightland Sea, where they'd been spotted by the harbour master, who unbeknownst to them had called the police. Mick's friend, Gordon Stevens, lived right on the beach. So once the boat was on the trailer, they all stopped off for a cup of tea. Jack remembered he'd left the lights on in the Range Rover and went to turn them off, but he never came back. When Mick went to find him, he poked his head over the embankment and saw Jack being interviewed by two coppers and dashed back to the house. He and Peter took all the incriminated evidence they could find. Receipts from abroad, foreign money, maps, backup coordinates for the GPS, everything, and burned them in a toilet. Mick had been trying to avoid giving his name, because he knew of his track record. They'd clap him in irons as soon as he did. Only they didn't. So he decided to call their bluff. Whilst they were waiting for customs to arrive, he made an excuse about needing to get onto the boat and deprogrammed the GPS. That was pretty critical because the system stores all the coordinates of the last journey. If anyone had looked at them, they would have seen that Mick had left early the previous day, made a brief stop in Blankenburg, a brief stop in Point Clear, and then come back to the marina. Mick wouldn't have a leg to stand on, but as it was, he was able to get rid of the evidence. He still had time to kill, and the police didn't seem bothered, so he gave them a story about needing to get the salt water off the boat, and began washing down the insides, hoping to get any loose traces of cannabis out and it virtually succeeded. Mick was totally relaxed about the whole thing. In fact, he thought it was really funny that they'd blown it, kept right on laughing about it as he took me to his mum's garage in his high lux and gave me a couple of kilos to sell. It was another story he could add to his list of narrow escapes. He was totally convinced that it was just bad luck that he'd been spotted by the harbour master, but I wasn't so convinced. Now, I've got no way of proving it, but I'm pretty sure I'm right about what really happened that morning. Everyone knows that customs don't find for call by pure chance. Most of the time they're acting on tip-offs. But when they swooped on Mick and Jack, I think they're acting on a tip-off that they should be on the lookout for a certain small boat coming in from the sea in the early hours. And who did the tip in? I think it was Dopey Harris. Why him? Well, for one thing, that was the trip that he found out that we took the stuff back to England by boat. None of us knew about the second reason at the time. But once we did, it became blindingly obvious that Harris had absolutely nothing to lose and £124,000 worth of everything to gain. I wasn't worried, just a bit pissed off. You always get someone who wants to try it on. They buy some puff on credit, have a few joints, then try to pull one over on you by saying it isn't any good and asking you to cut the price. You just have to be firm and aggressive. But this time was different. It wasn't just one or two calls. Everyone I'd sold to was coming back and complaining. And it wasn't like they were saying the stuff wasn't as strong as they expected. What I'd sold them short, they were saying the stuff was shit. Completely unspokable crap. A couple of them were totally going mad. They thought I was trying to have them over. They were screaming down the phone at me. What the fuck are you playing at? What is this stuff you've sold us? 
Because it sure as shit ain't Puff. You're having a laugh, ain't ya? I called up Mick and told him that Harris had ripped us off. It turned out he'd been getting complaints all night long as well, but couldn't get hold of Harris. We arranged to meet at a pub near his house, and he handed me a five kilo pack of drugs, wrapped differently to the rest. He asked me to test them to see if they're any good. I took them home and Sandra tried a bit, and immediately felt sick. It was all rubbish. Every last gram. I phoned Mick again and tried to break the news to him as gently as possible. I slowly explained that the biggest drug shipment he'd been involved in since getting back into smuggling, the one he'd almost got caught bringing into the country by customs, had been a complete waste of time. Still, went ballistic. By the time I'd arrived at Mick's house early on Monday evening, his mood had gone from bad to worse. He was pacing up and down and showing me the pictures of this girl on the front of the local paper. He was really angry, stamping around, sweating, ranting and raving. He was saying, this is bang out of order. This is going to fuck things up for the rest of us. Mick was particularly upset because of the girl's dad being an ex-copper. He was convinced that the bloke would pull in all sorts of favours. And thanks to the wall-to-wall publicity, the whole case was getting, make sure the gang behind the pills were caught. As far as Mick was concerned, if the one of them got done and the police started looking into their associates, and he'd be in the frame too. It wasn't like the police would have far to look either. Tate was on the phone to Steele virtually every night, complaining about the dodgy cannabis shipment and demanding his money back. Normally Steele would have told him where to get off. That picking up a bad shipment is just one of those things that he'd lost money on the deal too. But that would have only made Tate more angry and he was desperate to get him out of his hair. The last thing he wanted was to be dragged into the Leah thing. Tate in the meantime was shouting his mouth off to anyone who would listen about how Steele had tried to stitch him up and how he wasn't a man that anyone should ever cross. I think some of it was just bravado to make him look good in front of Tucker and Rolf, and some of it was just the drugs talking. I don't think Tate would have ever said any of it directly to Mick, but he did the next best thing. He told Sarah Saunders. Since she'd broken up with Pat, Mick had been spending more and more time with her, and was helping her in all sorts of ways. Mick thought of himself as something of a ladies man, and I started to think the two of them might even have been having an affair. Mick wasn't scared of what Pat was saying. He was just pissed off that he was going to fuck the operation. At the end of the day, Mick had a good, clean, neat little setup, which no one knew anything about. It had gone completely unnoticed several times before they'd accidentally got spotted, but even then everyone had been released. But Pat was spoiling it because he was telling too many people. He thought the bit that we did was easy, when in fact it was the most difficult bit of all. Pat was always trying to set other people up to smuggle for him. A week or so before the bad shipment, he'd even had the cheek to bring in some bloke who'd only just got his pilot's license and insist that Mick tell him all about flying the drugs over the channel. But Mick wasn't worried about losing business as much as about Pat letting too many people know how he operated. Pat thought he was out of reach and everybody was scared of him, but he reckoned without Mick. Later that night, still called up and asked if I wanted to go to Amsterdam with him. Apparently everyone else he'd tried had said no. They suspected that Harris had deliberately ripped us off and that going back over there to try to get the money back was suicide. But Mick didn't seem worried and that made me more confident. There was also the fact that although I'd already spent it, I hadn't earned any money for the last deal because I had to give it all back. I was desperate for cash and Mick promised to pay me for the trip. Also Mick only planned to be in Amsterdam for a couple of hours. Just enough time to pick up the money and have a drink, he said. He'd done enough to convince me. Okay, Mick, count me in. I picked up Mick from Angus Green and we drove down to Harwich in my old Land Rover. Freezing our bollocks off all the way because the Rover's got a window missing. We were travelling overnight, so I had a change of clothing with me. When we got to the ferry terminal, I booked the tickets in my name, got some gilders from the bureau to change. We were trying to make a holiday of it, keeping the mood light. We had a meal in the restaurant of the departure lounge and got a cabin on the boat. We had a few drinks in the bar where they had some live singers then went to the boat cinema and watched a film then went to our cabin to get a few hours sleep before we arrived in Amsterdam. We met Dopey Harris in the bar. He said he was happy to give us the money back there and then but he only had it in Gilders. Harris wanted the drugs back. God knows why as they were all crap but Mick told him they were safe back in England and as soon as we had the money, it set up a collection. It was just after 10am, so Mick said we'd go back in the afternoon to give him some time to get some money together. No one was going to want to have to change their money over back in England, especially as banks and bureaus to change have to report transactions of more than £10,000. 
We spent the day sightseeing, went back to the bar about 5pm. Harris took us upstairs and handed over £30,000 sterling. He apologised but said basically there hadn't been many Brits making sales that day, so there wasn't a lot of sterling around. Again, he said we could have the rest in Gilders, but Mick decided to stay overnight and see what he could raise the next day. For the rest of the afternoon, we were either sightseeing or having a giggle in the red light district, or in some bar drinking loads of beer, or in some restaurant stuffing our faces. I was having the time of my life. It was the closest thing to a holiday I'd had in years, and Mick and I were getting on really well. That night, we booked into the Delta Hotel, and I booked a twin room in my name. Mick didn't want anything to link with him, but gave me the money to pay for it. We put the cash that Harris had given us into the hotel safe, and spent the rest of the night out on the piss. It was nearly lunchtime when we got round to Harris's the next day, but he said we still hadn't left it long enough. We'd have to come back. That afternoon, Mick and I went to Madame Two Swords and had a photo taken with Tina Turner. At around 5pm, we went back to the bar again, and Harris gave us another £50,000 in sterling. He said that he might have more tomorrow, so we decided to spend yet another night in the Delta. By now, the novelty was really starting to wear off. I'd enjoyed it at first, but I was still wearing the same set of clothes that I'd had, and all the endless drinking and eating was starting to get really boring. We could never relax properly because we were so anxious to get going, but every plan we made to get a particular train or something ended up being postponed. Most of the Brits are going to Amsterdam to spend the whole time off their faces on Super Skunk, but neither Mick or I smoked the stuff. We just smuggled it. We went to Harris's yet again the next day, and he told us that he wouldn't have any sterling at all that day. At first, Mick decided to stay another night, and we booked the Delta again, but around about 5pm, Mick was getting so bored and restless with Amsterdam that he decided to accept the rest, about £40,000 in guilders. We went back to Harris's and told him, and he said we could have the rest of the money in one hour. In that time, Mick bought some phone cards. The batteries on both our mobiles were dead by now, and called up Jack Wombs, Pat Tate and the others to tell them to come over and meet him in Ostend to pick up the money. Mick didn't want to risk being found with too much on him at one time, so the idea was lots of people to come over and take a few thousand back each. Harris told Mick that, with the way the exchange rate was, he had given us more than enough to cover the debt. He seemed very keen to make amends, and never stopped apologising for having sold us the dodgy puff in the first place. Having hated the guy's guts a few days earlier, we ended up thinking as he waved us goodbye and wished us well that perhaps he wasn't such a bad bloke after all. We collected our bags from the hotel and were just making our way down to the train station when I thought I saw a familiar face. Now, Amsterdam's a fairly small place. If you hang out in the centre long enough, you do tend to see the same faces doing the usual circuits of bar and clubs. But this bloke didn't look like he was actually going anywhere. He looked like he was following us. I couldn't be sure. The bloke was quite far behind and he may or may not have been with a couple of other people, but I thought I might as well mention it to Mick. It turned out that he had already spotted him, and was equally concerned. Instead of heading straight for the station, we took a longer, slighter, odder route. The bloke was still there. So we walked along a canal, and popped into a bar for a quick drink. When we came back, the bloke was still there. The fact that we spotted him meant the guy wasn't good enough to be a professional, so the most likely explanation was that Harris had decided to arrange a nasty little surprise mugging in an attempt to get his money back. With that in mind, Neither of us liked the idea of being trapped on a speeding train if it all kicked off, so we decided to take drastic action. When we got to the station, we nipped over to the road and jumped into a taxi. Hi, said Mick, can you take us to Ostend? The driver's jaw nearly hit the floor. It was a bit like getting into a black cab outside Charing Cross Station and asking to be taken to Manchester. At first the driver wanted a thousand guilders, but we offered him 600. Eventually we set it on 800, around 400 pound and we set off. We told him to take a scenic route out of the city, going around roundabout several times, that sort of thing, until we were sure no one was following us anymore. It had all looked really jolly from where I was, but Mick was actually really pissed off. Tate was saying it was too late for them to get the ferry back, so they'd have to stay overnight. But they wanted Mick to pay for it, because they didn't have any Belgian money, and besides, he owed them for making them wait a week for their cash. I think by then Mick just wanted the whole thing to be over as quickly as possible. He was saying how out of control Tate seemed, how he was really hyped up over everything and behaving like a five year old. It was getting really late and he said I might as well stay as well. 
as Jack would be there soon. So I used my credit card to book into the same hotel as him. About 10 minutes later, Jack arrived in his transit van and as Mick wanted something to eat, we all wandered up the road to this Greek restaurant for a snack. Jack had been so paranoid that he'd worked up an elaborate excuse to explain while he was leaving the country. He was pretty freaked out about what had happened with customs at Felixstowe Ferry and wanted to make sure he had a cast iron alibi in case it all came on top. He had travelled over in his transit, even had a spare wheel and brake drum in the back so he could say he was on his way to repair a vehicle. He even booked a commercial ticket which cost him around £220 just so it was all legit. So as in Sod's law, he didn't get stopped by customs once. Jack had two glasses of orange then left, taking half of the gilders with him. After that, Mick and I stayed in the restaurant and had a chat about what to do with the dodgy cannabis that Harris had sold us. After the experience of being followed, Mick didn't trust the guy at all and didn't want to risk handing it over to someone in Britain, just in case it turned out to be a setup. Just get rid of them, Darren. The whole lot, he told me. I don't care what you do. I just never want to see any of it again. It was just after that that Mick first asked me if I could help him out. I don't remember anything about what I was doing, who I was with, where I was, or even the time of day. The only thing I remember was the question, can you get me a gun? We'd only been back from Amsterdam a few days, and Mick was saying that any sort would do, a handgun or a shotgun. I had a friend, Roy, who had an illegal shotgun, which he used for shooting rabbits. So I told Mick I'd ask him. Roy had sold his gun, but he told me to ask a couple of people and see what I could come up with. Over the next week, Mick called me virtually every single day to find out I was getting on. I told him I wasn't having much luck, but he told me to keep on trying. I know it sounds stupid, but they didn't bother to ask Mick what he wanted it for. I know I had a bit of a rat problem at the Meadow Cottage, and I guess I just assumed he was going to use it for that. And then as quickly as they started, the calls just stopped, and I forgot all about it. All day long I'd been dying for a beer. I got this new contract working down at a site near Heathrow Airport, which was paying good money, but meant getting up at five in the morning and driving more than 100 miles. We'd finished quite early, and I'd normally be home by six, but the days are still pretty exhausting. After a long hard day, the only way I can unwind is to go down the pub for a few pints. Most of the time, that was okay, but every now and again, Sandra would kick up a fuss and have a go at me for not spending enough time with the kids. When that happened, I'd stay in for a couple of nights, make sure I got in the way. Then, they'd practically be begging me to go down to the pub, so she could have some peace and quiet. I'd been a good boy for the past two nights, even helping out with housework and stuff like that, and now, I was getting to get my reward. I was going down to my local, have a couple of games of pool, and get completely and utterly plastered. At around 2pm, just as I was finishing for the day, Mick called me up on my mobile, and asked me to meet him at Mark's Tay as soon as possible. It was a place we'd met up a few times, because basically it's roughly halfway between our two houses, but it made a detour on my way home, and therefore a delay in me getting the beers in. Mick didn't say why I wanted to meet, so I assumed it was sent to do with drugs. Either another run he wanted me to go on, or some new stock he wanted me to sell. I was really tempted to say I couldn't make it, but I didn't want to let him down. I'd been doing a lot of work on his house during the evenings at the weekends, and I didn't want to risk losing the extra income. At first, I said I'd meet him about 4pm, then I changed it to 5pm, because that way, I knew I'd have time for a couple of quick beers on the way. It'd really give me a taste for it, but I hadn't had anywhere near enough. I'd only teased my taste buds. As I parked up, I started hoping that whatever it was that Mick wanted, it wouldn't take too long, so I could get home and get on some serious drinking. After a few minutes, I saw a familiar red Hilux pull up, and I went over and got in the passenger side. Mick started telling me that him and Pat had finally sorted their differences out, and it was planning to meet him that evening. Apparently a plane with a motherload of cocaine was going to be landing in some field, and they were going to meet it for some kind of deal. Sounds good, I said. So what do you want me to do? Mick explained that my role was to drive Jack down to the meeting place and then pick the two of them up afterwards. I want Pat to think that I'm meeting him on my own, he told me. Now, this is the point in the story where people start saying to me, didn't you think it was all a bit odd? Weren't there alarm bells ringing in your head? The answer was, I'm afraid of saying no. As far as I'm concerned, there was a cocaine deal going down between Pat and Mick. I knew by now Pat was a bit of a loose cannon, especially after the pizza incident and was not averse to ripping people off, even his friends. Now, it was unlikely to try anything with Mick, but if it was me, I would have played it the same way. 
rather than going to meet him with some money, I'd have had someone holding it nearby just to make sure it wasn't a trap. I didn't see anything wrong with it at all. As Mick and I were talking, Jack pulled up behind in his tatty old VW Passat that I'd actually sold to Mick a couple of weeks earlier. Jack came up to say a quick hello, then we all set off towards the halfway house pub. Me and Mick in the Hilux, and Jack following behind. On the way, Mick explained that when we got a bit nearer, we would pull over so I could get in the Passat with Jack. Mick didn't want us to be seen, otherwise Tate would realise he had company. Once I was in the other car, Jack would tell me exactly what to do. Just before we got to the pub, we stopped in the entrance to the country park and Mick told me to get in the Passat with Jack. He turned the car around, then produced a set of false number plates with double sided sticky tape on them. He tried to stick them over the existing plates, but it was too damp and wet, so eventually he gave up. I got into the driver's seat and told him to head to the halfway house and wait close to the exit of the car park. From where we were, we had a clear view of the car park entrance and we could see all the cars coming in. We also could see Mick's Hilux parked over the other side of the pub, but no signs of Mick. What are we waiting for? I asked Jack. There was no reply. It was pretty cold, so I kept the engine running to stop the window steaming up and stop us freezing, but I knew a better way of staying warm. Hey, I said, well, we're waiting. Let's go and pub and have a couple of beers. Jack slowly turned his head and looked at me. No, he said firmly. I suppose I wasn't all that surprised. Jack wasn't just teetotal, he was some kind of freak. All he ever drank was water and orange juice. He didn't touch anything fizzy and he wouldn't even go near tea or coffee. His only vice was chocolate. He ate galaxy bars like they were going out of fashion. All of a sudden Jack said, right off we go. As I pulled away, I looked towards the car park entrance and saw a dark blue coloured Range Rover coming in. I couldn't see who was inside, but I assumed it was Pat's car. We set off down the A130 and Jack said he was going to show me where to drop him off and pick him up. And then I was to leave him there and come back when he rang me as soon as they had completed the deal. I drove over to the Retterton Turnpike, still on the A130 towards Chelmsford. I went up the hill towards Retterton Village and was bombing down the other side when Jack told me to slow down as it would be soon doing a right turn. He pointed out to this tiny little lane ahead and told me to turn into it and turn the car around immediately. I did as I was told and watched this Jack get out of the car and took some stuff off the back seat. He took a coat, a prison junkie jacket, with a plastic bit on the back cut off and a big canvas sausage bag. As Jack was walking away, I asked him if I had time for a quick beer while he was gone. What are you? Some kind of alcoholic? We won't be long. Just fuck off and wait. And when you come back, turn around straight away again so we can head off straight away. And then he vanished into the darkness. I checked my phone and saw that I wasn't picking up much of a signal, so I decided to move. I ended up driving up past the lane and then took the first turn in on the left. I went down a little way and turned around so I ended up parked up a bit of a hill. I looked at the phone again to check the signal and at that very moment it started ringing. It was Jack. Come and get us, he said. That was quick, I replied, but the line had already gone dead. He'd hung up. I retraced my steps, pulled into the lane and immediately turned the car around. Almost straight away, Jack was at the back door of the car and got in, sitting in the darkness. Where's Mick? I asked. It won't be long. He's dropped something. Doesn't want to leave it there, said Jack. Then he made this really weird sound, a bit like a series of quiet little snorts. I could just make out his silhouette in the rear view mirror and his big shoulders were bobbing up and down. It took me a little while to work out what was going on. Jack was giggling. I was still looking at Jack in the rear view mirror when Mick appeared and opened the front passenger door. As soon as he did, the interior light went on and that's when I saw Jack's hands. He was wearing surgical gloves and had been splashed with streaks of blood. On the back of one hand was a lump of greyish slime surrounded by lumps of hair and skin and more blood. Turn that fucking light out now, screamed Mick. I didn't think. I went into autopilot and started scrambling about on the roof of the car trying to find the light switch. But as Mick sat down, he shut the door and the light went off anyway. And suddenly, it was pitch black again. But I could still see Jack's hands. I could still see the blood and bits of brain. And I felt like someone had sucked all the air out of me because I wanted to speak. I desperately wanted to say something, but no matter how much I tried, I just couldn't get any words out. Mick told me to get going 
and though my mind was elsewhere, my body somehow obeyed, putting the car into gear and moving off towards the main road. From then on, everything happened in slow motion. I saw the headlights, heard the screech of tyres, and braced myself for the impact, but it never came. Mick had grabbed the steering wheel at the last moment and wrenched it to one side, avoiding the crash by just a few inches. The other driver flashed his lights and swore at me out of his half-open window. I just pulled out onto the main road without looking, but I honestly didn't know where I was or what I was doing. I just sat there like a zombie. For fuck's sake, Darren, drive carefully, said Mick. What are you trying to do, kill us all? Jack, sitting behind, thumped the back of the seat with his fist. Fucking arsehole, he growled. I was still in shock, but I felt myself slowly coming back down to earth. I mumbled a half-hearted apology and carried on driving back towards a resident turnpike. All at once I felt like I was going to be sick, that I had a spitting headache, and that I was freezing cold and boiling hot. My mind was racing, but it kept coming back to the fact that I'd only been away for a couple of minutes. Surely they didn't have time to do anything. I desperately wanted to know exactly what had happened back there, but at the same time, I desperately didn't want to know anything about it at all. I just couldn't take it in. I wanted to pretend that I hadn't seen anything or heard anything. But it wasn't going to happen. Mick turned to Jack and broke the silence. Those cunts won't be threatening us again, he said. Too right, came the reply. I was trying to concentrate on the road when the glint of metal caught my eye. I chanced a sideways glance and saw that Mick was passing Jack the barrels of a sawn-off shotgun, followed by the stock and the trigger mechanism. And then it got worse. Jack moved forward, so he was sitting with his head between the front two seats, just the way that naughty kids do when they're little, and he and Mick started going over the details of what they'd done. I tell you, Darren, it was well funny, he said with a grin, because Mick shot one of them, and his gun fell apart. Bits all over the place. That's what he was looking for. The thing he dropped. I couldn't believe it. There we were, trying to do a job. He spends half the time on the floor trying to find a fucking barrel. By now, Mick was smiling too. Did you shoot the back window by mistake? He asked. Jack shook his head. No, I think Pat must have done it with his hand. I never miss. Not from that distance anyway. Then Jack turned to Mick. You should have seen him, Darren. It was pathetic. Hard man. <laughs> Squealing like a baby he was. I had absolutely no idea what to say or what to do. How do you respond to something like that? I felt as if I was no longer in the car. Just a spectator looking on and listening in. All I could think was, what the fuck am I doing here? What's going to happen now? Mick spoke again. Hey, you never believe it, Jack. That supper cow Sarah, she only phoned Pat's mobile just as we was going down the fucking lane. All that talk about how she hates him, wants him out of her life, and how pleased she'd be if something bad happened to him. And then there they are, having this lovey-dovey chat. Made me want to throw up. Actually, I was shitting myself. I was just waiting for him to say, I'm here with Mick and some of the lads. And that would have been it. I'd have had to call the whole thing off. But he never did, thank fuck. I bet she'd kick herself if she knew how close she'd come to saving him. Jack grunted in agreement, and Mick continued. Mind you, don't know how I'd have stopped you. When we got to the bottom of the lane, and the gate was locked... I didn't have a clue where the fuck you were until you handed me the gun and started shooting. I thought we'd blown it. I heard myself speak, my voice soft and low. I hope I never upset the two of you. For some reason, Mick and Jack thought this was hilarious. The two of them fell apart, absolutely pissing themselves. Nah, chuckled Mick, wiping away tears of laughter. You're not like them. Wouldn't happen to you. Although I knew the roads reasonably well, the state I was in, meant that Mick and Jack had to give me instructions for every turn, like was some learner driver. Left at the swimming pool shop, left at the first set of traffic lights, down at the bottom, second on the right, into the car park of the Hungry Horse pub. I spotted Mick's Toyota Hilux pick up in a corner and pulled up the Passat alongside. It was only when I tried to stand up that I realised how much I was shaking. Jack and Mick jumped out and started changing their clothes. They were still really emanated talking quickly, but I was no longer listening to what they were saying. It was then that I noticed for the first time that they were wearing identical outfits, dark green boiler suits, wearing some boots and surgical rubber gloves, all of which were stuffed into a couple of bin liners and placed in the back of the truck. As I stood watching them, I tried to throw up, 
but nothing came out. Jack took the Passat and drove off, while Mick got into the Hilux and waved me into the passenger seat. Then we set off for Mark's Tay, while my own car was waiting. As soon as Jack had gone, Mick's mood changed. He was quieter, more thoughtful. He was obviously going over the evening's event in his mind. And then after a few minutes of silence, he suddenly said, Jack's a cold-hearted bastard. What do you mean? I asked. The second I got out of the Range Rover, he leaned in with the pump action and shot the three of them. Boom, boom, boom. Just like that. Like it was nothing to worry about. He was just so detached, so emotionless. It was like he was serving up chips or something. I mean, he could have been doing anything. But we had to do it together, you see. That way one of us could never give evidence against the other. We'd both be equally guilty. That was the deal. I said nothing. All day long I'd been dying for a beer. But now all I could think about was drinking half a bottle of whiskey to blot everything out. I suggested we both went for a drink or three. At first, Mick agreed. But by the time we got to Mark's Tay, he'd changed his mind and said it would be best if we went straight home. I knew my wife and kids were expecting me, but I just couldn't face them. Pulled out my mobile and phoned my mate Rick. Told him I'd be having a shitty day and asked him to meet me down the pub. He stayed for a couple and we talked about any old bollocks. But then he had to go home to his girlfriend. In the end, I just stayed there on my own, sitting in the corner and drinking myself into an absolute stupor. Thank you.